Today on Lockdown Red Wings, they lose to the Panthers. They lose to the Maple Leafs. Three-game losing streak. But on the bright side, Jonathan Berggren looks like a legitimate NHL player. You're Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Lockdown Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I am a podcast producer for the Daily J, a WWJ News Radio podcast. Well, Scotty is a freelance journalist for the Detroit News as well as a host of Locked On Tigers. And um, yeah, Red Wings lost both games this weekend. Super fun. It was it was an and, enjoyment uh, to watch. And uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, that's the analysis, right? It's just... Yeah, that's the show. Thanks for making Locked on Red Wings your first <laughs> listen every day, man. It, it gets to a point. So, obviously, they lose to the Panthers on Friday, 3-2. to two, uh, And then they lose, what was it, 4-1 to one last night. Or as of recording this, it was last night. Um, to the Toronto Maple Leafs. And we talked about it going into the weekend. Like, you want to at least get one of these wins, right? You think you can take... you got to capitalize on Panthers who are down bad, not playing well. And... I mean, I guess we'll lead off at the game against the Panthers because chronologically it's the one that happened first. But, you know, conversations, you know, with the ebb and flow of conversations, we bleed over into the Toronto game a little bit. It happens because both of those games happened to, in the past to us. So sometimes they happen. You can't help but merge. They in the past to, to the listeners too. Yeah, well, what if – no, never mind. I was going to make a joke. <laughs> but we'll move on. We'll move on. Keep, keep it moving. Keep it moving. Focus. Um, the thing that was really frustrating with the Panthers game – well, it's frustrating with all the games. Just the lack of goal scoring that we've seen in the last three-game oh, losing streak is four goals, four in a three-game losing streak is not going to win you any hockey games. Clearly didn't win you any hockey games. But I think with the Panthers game, what was the most frustrating, it was the exact same game that we watched against the New Jersey Devils. The exact same game yeah. where the Red Wings actually outplayed the Panthers at even strength, at five-on-five, five, had all the numbers on their side to back it up. Had a ton of scoring shots, ton of sh shots, ton of scoring chances, and just couldn't find the back of the net. And then when the Red Wings got to the power play, there was no power behind it. And then when they went in on the penalty kill, it was just they no one was covering any man. They gave so much space to the other team in the defensive zone, and the Panthers could just do whatever they want to score a goal. And they scored two power play goals. And again, I think we brought it up on Friday's episode, but Prashanth Iyer mentioned that their penalty kill was beneath 70% since Thanksgiving. And it's just continued to fall as they continue to give more. Like they have clearly have to change something because whatever they were doing early in the season, when they had the best penalty kill in the league, the other teams have figured out and you're sinking to the bottom of the standings so fast with a team that shouldn't be sinking to the bottom of the standings. It's and like, I know they're on a three game losing streak. And I, so I know I'm, it's going to be one of those episodes where I'm like really down on the team, but how could I not when, it's just such a frustrating watch watching them go out there every single night and maybe put out a decent effort, but just not get rewarded with it because whatever scheme they're running just isn't isn't working. Yeah, the, the five on five play is definitely like a weird part of this. You know, like it, it's one thing to just the, the elephant in the room is just how terrible the special teams has been lately and especially during this three game losing streak. But even dating back, I mean, the last what, three weeks, month? Yeah. I mean, it's it really both sides of the special teams have been pretty uh, – have taken a, a marginal step back from where they were at, at the beginning of the season. And, you know, if, if you go back and and we t listen to, like, the episodes from the episodes all pre, like, American Thanksgiving, this is uh, – a uh, like, our commentary was constantly – we get shelled on the five-on-five, five, but – we make up for it with really good special teams and goals on the rush. There is, I don't know what happened, but now there's this like five on five play. We're not getting dominated in every night. And uh, some nights are even just like straight up outplaying our opponent in the five on five. And then the special teams is just abysmal. I, I mean, this weekend was, was really rough and, the Panthers game was the, I think, the worst example of it. That was that was brutal. I mean, it was brutal on on both ends of of the special teams unit. And yeah, I, I mean, 
<laughs> it, it's just it's frustrating because we know that the team is capable of producing on special teams. And it, it just it doesn't every different part of the season, different game, et cetera. It just, it always feels like that this team doesn't have the ability to just have it all click. Like, like something is always lacking, whether it is the five on five, whether it is the special teams, whether it is the goaltending that night, whether it is the defending, whether it is just putting the puck in the back of the net, like something is always missing. And, and there's been pieces of all of these happening successfully but we don't have like a period where it's all working together at once in a positive direction in the same game. Yeah, I absolutely. You said it all right there. It's the complete inverse of everything we had been seeing earlier in the season. You know, that, that special teams domination is gone, but the struggling five on five has picked it up. Not, not like they're great now. They still, it's still close most nights. Right. Yeah. But in the Panthers game, for example, I mean, at even strength, you had a 59% um, percentage of the Corsi percentage. You had a 58% Fenwick, a 57% uh, shot percentage. So the actual pucks that made it to the net, you had 57% of the shots. Um, your scoring chances for were 59%, and your expected goals for were 53 And your high danger Corsi 4 percentage was 59%. So every single metric in the Panthers game, you had the edge in or dominated at even strength. But even despite all of that, the team could not find the back of the net. And I don't know if they're snake bitten. I don't know if it's the inability to get the rebound. Cause that's something I noted in the Toronto game. Big time was that when they, and th this is a team that's actually been doing better. I thought lately of setting up in the offensive zone occasionally, not like consistently, but like they'll get set, set up in the offensive zone. They'll pass the puck around decently anymore. Get, yeah. get shot. I mean, they still have some pretty good rushes. No, uh, no. Like, I'm, I'm just saying night, like, but, it's, yeah, it's not the entire offense anymore, but they get the puck and they either take a poor shooting opportunity or it's a shot from, I guess that's, that's really what it comes down to is they're, they're dominating these categories, but I don't know. Cause even, they're considered high danger. So it's like, I don't know what the team needs to do besides just bury the rebound because it feels like every single time they shoot the puck and the goalie makes the save, that puck comes out off of the goaltender's pads to an area where there is no red wing. And I don't know if that's just really bad luck or really bad positioning or a little bit of both because there were at least two or three goals that were left on the table in the Toronto game where that shot came off the pad of Samsonov and there was no Red Wing there to bury it and burying rebounds is such a crucial part I mean that's such a no dust statement but being in front of the net ready with your stick on the ice in a spot where that rebound is going to come from is huge and it just seems like the Red Wings really struggled to, to dominate that net front area while in the defensive zone it's all the other team manages to do is just be in front of the Red Wings net with no opposition, no pressure. I've noted it in games past. Like that's how a lot of goals happen is the Red Wings defenders tend to allow the other teams off offense, other teams forwards to have the inside lane in front of the net. So they'll have first dibs on any puck coming off of the goaltender's pads. Like you have got to make sure you are between the goalie and the forward so that you can tie him up easier. If you're behind that forward in front of the net, it's harder to tie them up. And at just it, it seems like in the offensive zone, they, they don't establish that net front presence. And the defensive zone, that's all they do is give up that net front presence. It feels like in the defensive zone, when the other team gets set up, it's it's a lot of running around, a lot of chasing. And it, it's just the amount of missed assignments as well. And we'll get to Ben Sherat in segment, whatever, two or three, whatever this rant ends. But... It's just, it, it gets, it's very frustrating to watch right now when the team at five on five is having the bulk of the chances, but not finding the back of the net. And then every time they get a penalty, it's like, okay, well, tally that one because that's a goal. And you just count on it. It's, it's, it's really frustrating. It is. Absolutely. I, I think that not only this stretch, but really just this entire season, uh, one thing that is abundantly clear is that this, Detroit Red Wings team, if they want to take the next step, and I, I'm not saying whether it's internal and 
the the player is like young and developing or it's somebody that's on the NHL roster or it's it's external and it's somebody that's going to be a free agent and that we're going to trade for but i think it is abundantly clear that this team needs a consistent like go to goal scorer like that is we we've seen it again like no matter what part of the season you look at whether it's this current era where like randomly the five on five is a lot better but the power play is not as good or you go back to early in the season where the five on five was garbage and and it was all rushes and 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 special teams like no matter what this team needs somebody that whether it's like one time or specialty whether it's like put the puck on the stick and get out of the way like i don't care but like this team needs a consistent goal scoring threat and that because when they go in stretches like this, I mean, I mean, again, our, our goal totals in the last three games are one, two, one, like you, 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 they desperately need somebody who they can just lean on and be like, all right, we need some pucks in the back of the net and, and it might not win us a game, but at least we're going to put up a lot more of a fight. We're not going to have to hold the opposition to one in order to, to win this hockey game. And uh, I, 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 that is not on the roster right now. Again, it might, mm-hmm. somebody might develop into that or, or, or what, whatever, but as it stands right now on January 9th, that does not exist on the Detroit Red Wings roster. Absolutely. I completely agree. Uh, we'll continue this conversation in segment two, but first I got to talk to you guys today about athletic greens. Our next partner has a product you need to use literally every day. You got to start taking AG one because with one, Delicious scoop of AG1. You're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. The special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging, all those things. It's lifestyle-friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free. It contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals, or artificial anything while still tasting super good. Athletic Greens was created when the founder experienced a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine to recover. It cost him $100 a day. He created Athletic Greens after experiencing how difficult it was to create an optimal nutrition routine on your own. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition it's just one scoop in a cup of water every day that's it no need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health to make it easy athletic greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune supporting vitamin d and five free travel packs with your first purchase all you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash nhl network again that is athleticgreens.com slash nhl network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance Segment two, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. Scotty, you really hit on something that is, I think, major to the process of this rebuild. Is And you look at any single team that's dominating right now in the NHL, and they all have one thing in common, is they have at least one superstar on this roster. And it's very blatant that that is something that this team lacks. Dylan Larkin is a very good player. Very good player. But at this point, we know he's not a superstar. It's 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 past the point of waiting for that breakout season. He's the captain. He's a good captain. And he's a very good hockey player capable of probably getting between 80 and 90 points in like peak year. But we need that player who can eclipse 100 points. We don't have a Nathan McKinnon or a Kale McCarr or a Nikita Kucherov, a Steven Stamkos, Austin, Ma- Austin Matthews, Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, David Pasternak. I mean, I could go on and on and on. You get every team that's at the top of their division standings, and this team lacks that. That superstar caliber player who can take over a game and change it like that. You look at the game between the Edmonton Oilers and the Colorado Avalanche last night, rematch of the Western Conference Finals last year. The Avalanche were down two to one, or two to nothing, rather. And Nathan McKinnon said, okay, let's cut that deficit in half and just skated through the entire team down the ice and put the puck in the back of the net with a highlight reel goal. I mean, this team lacks that player. And this team needs that player because on paper, Scotty. It's a safety net. It's a safety like, net. It, it, you know what I mean? Like, it's 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 not even, like, yes, like, you know, like a, a superstar is something that all the teams at the top need. But it, it's more so, like, just anybody you can – just like, hey, we need a goal here. Who are we giving the puck to? You, 
That answer, if you asked the fan base that question right now, you would get a lot of different answers. I'm sure a majority would be Larkin, but like it's not like Larkin's going to put up a 45, 50 goal season. Like, yeah, th- there there is no like bona fide like this is the correct answer to that question. If you're like, hey, you're down one in the third, you need a goal. Who are you trying to set up, and who are you trying to get the p- put the puck on their stick? You're going to get a like 15 different answers because. That we just that that doesn't exist on this hockey team. There is no safety valve. There is no oh my goodness, everything's going wrong. We need to to stop the bleeding. We need to put the the, the band aid on. Who do we go to? That that's that's and, an, an, an open ended question that doesn't have a solidified answer at the moment. And to play devil's advocate to my own argument, like even Nathan McKinnon took several years to become Nathan McKinnon, and so like Moritz Sider, for instance, who's probably the closest we have to a super superstar caliber player who's just not, he's still developing. I don't think he'll ever be a, like, he's not Kale McCarr. That's not his game. He does have an offensive upside, but I think his style of superstar would be a shutdown style. Like he'll get a game will be close and he'll shut the game down for the Red Wings. Sure. Just to clinch the win. Lucas Raymond potential is there. Yeah. He, he's struggling a little bit. I, he's not struggling, struggling. Um, He's definitely no, not putting up the goal plateau, totals he was yeah. last year. Um, But like, those guys could take a few more years. As of right now, the team doesn't have it. And I don't, it, there's not like that. Moritz Sider is a blue chip, like not a prospect anymore, but he was a blue chip prospect. Simon Evanson, blue chip. But these guys aren't guys who are going to com- score you 50 goals a season, 40 goals a season. This team desperately needs that guy and they don't have it. But what they do have is Jonathan Bergeron. Jonathan Berggren. It's Berggren officially, so I got to start pr- practicing yeah, saying that. And he is a stud. Absolutely yeah, a stud. Right. To kind of steer back into more of a, a positive light, he played fan-freaking-tastic in the game against the Panthers. He had that, the only, uh, sorry, they scored two goals. Robbie Fabry scored the other one, which we'll talk about because that's awesome to see. But uh, Jonathan Berggren scored the game-winning goal, or the game-winning goal, the only, one of two goals. Oh, my God, I can't get my facts straight in my head. Sorry, two games competing in my head right now. Uh, he scored one of the f- two only two goals against the Florida Panthers. It was a great deflection in off of a shot from the point. And he overall played a fantastic game against the Florida Panthers. He was when every single time he touched the puck, he was making something happen. And I said, he's not going to be, I don't see him as a superstar player, but he is absolutely a crucial building block to this rebuild because he is starting to look like a bona fide top six winger. Not just a middle six winger, but a top six winger with the Red Wings. And maybe, I know he was drafted as potentially a center. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if down the stretch here, if the Red Wings get eliminated, he starts getting look at the center role. Because if he's playing this well winger, and I understand that not everyone can transition to center at the NHL. And some players like Robbie Fabry, for instance, are better served as wingers. But the way he takes over shifts as a winger is crazy to see. I'm not getting ahead of myself to call him a superstar again. But he played so well in that Panthers game, was far and away the best player on the team, that he earned himself top-line opportunity against the Toronto Maple Leafs. And again, while he's not a superstar, he is an important, crucial building block for the Detroit Red Wings going forward. Absolutely. Yeah, and and, and whether his ceiling ends up being, you know, like, like really solid middle six production or whether it ends up being like a top-line talent, I think the middle six is probably more likely. Just- yeah because it's safer, but uh, he he is such a good skater, man. And I know that I sound like a broken record, and I say that pretty much every single day at this point, but it, it's it's really noticeable how, how impressive of a skater he is and how he's able to to find seams in the defense and exploit them, and uh, he, he's really, really impressive. So I, I mean, I, I look forward to watching him every night, and I really like that he got a top-line nod there uh, by the end of the weekend. Yeah, and you know Robbie Fabry had a fantastic game as well against the Florida Panthers. He it's obviously good since coming back. Yeah, he sat out in Toronto because they just don't want to overwork him coming yeah. off that ACL injury. But uh, he was expected goals four percentage was like fifty five percent. He was a relative of four point nine four. But I mean, this is a guy who I, I don't remember him being as physical as this. He's coming out and he's laying bodies out. He's making things happen in the offensive zone. Obviously, he scored with the empty net with what two minutes remaining to make it three to two. And that was electric. I was really hoping that that would just like give the jolt to the Red Wings that they needed to tie that game up yeah. late. But the Panthers were able to lock it down despite some really good late opportunity chances from yeah, the yeah, Red Wings. They ha- you know, and that's again like that was just the reoccurring theme of not only 
this weekend, but really just the last few weeks has just been a, a, an inability cons- to consistently put the puck in the back of the net. And like the, the play in the neutral zone, well, in, in any zone, really, like the, the play is not awful. Like it's not like a, like a horrible product. It's not, oh my goodness, we're getting burned in every facet of the game. Like it, it, it looks like an even game. It's just one every night one team has the ability to to fill the back of that net and one team doesn't and usually the red wings are the team that doesn't yeah i mean it's five on five red wings play well at five are playing well at five on five can't find the back of the net go on the penalty kill get scored on go on the power play don't score right. and that's how they lose and which is again i don't want to sound like a broken record going back to segment one inverse of what we saw early on in the season but yeah. how about those two hits from robbie fabry when he laid Anton Lundell out along the boards and Anton Lundell tries to get revenge at, uh, with an open ice hit, Fab- Fabry sees it coming and reverse hits him and puts him on his ass again. I mean, that was fun to see. And I'm, I'm enjoying every second of Robbie Fabry being in the lineup because he's such a, he's such an easy story to root for. Just absolutely. 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 So when we come back in segment three, we'll, we'll talk about the Toronto game. I know we spent two segments talking about the Panthers game. Um, no, we've kind of done both. We, we've kind of, yeah. Like we said, it's a flow. You know, some things flow. We, we notice them. Ebbs and flow. Ebbs and flow. But first, I got to talk to you guys today about Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from pro football to college bull season to basketball. Uh, they've got it all at betonline.net. If you love sports podcasts, you can find those at BetOnline as well. They're the easiest and fastest way to get all your betting info. Head to the website today to or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet Online, where the game starts. Segment three, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. Uh, game against Toronto, Scotty. Uh, it was kind of more the same. Now, you're playing the Toronto Maple Leafs, and they're really, really good. So while the wings came out flying, what a great first period it was. Um, and Jeff Rieger at 97.1 said this thing on the air the other day. I caught it. And he said that the Detroit Red Wings have not beat the Toronto Maple Leafs in the 2020s. In this decade, the Red Wings have not beat the Leafs yet. <sighs> and I was like, oh, great statistic to hear going into the game. And like, I feel like at the back of my head, I knew that because it feels like every time we play the Leafs, they just pump the Red Wings. Uh, but it was a fantastic first period. Obviously, Jake Wallman's goal was electric that guy great, gets man. so many breakaways for defensemen i don't even know how that manages to happen yeah i don't either but i i really like jake wallman like he, he, he's he's been one of the the i don't want to say like he's the story of the year or anything because that's a story a of too, the last two weeks for sure. right he's a little <laughs> dramatic probably yeah but he he has certainly been if you are talking about uh like all, all the positive developments on this team, he is certainly uh, in, in that conversation and probably toward the the upper half of that list. In the game against the Toronto Maple Leafs, he had a Corsi 4 percentage of 72.73%, which is the second best in the team, yeah. and a goal expected goals 4 percentage of 94.06. It was a .98 expected goals for and a .06 um, expected goals against against the Toronto Maple Leafs and he has earned ever. And that was in 15 minutes of even strength ice time. So that's right. a lot of even strength ice time to get to accumulate that much statistics, or in this case, that little expected goals against. So he and cider, I mean, cider has looked so much better playing alongside Wallman and Wallman honestly has despite no matter who he's playing with has looked fantastic. The, the offensive upside he has the speed, the agility, the vision, the rocket of a slap shot, and he's not bad in defensive zone either. Like he's, he's really fun. I, I'm not yeah. going to go out on a limb and say make any like hyperboles on what I think he's like, but because this could be a hot flash, but hot flash, a flash in the pan, hot flash is something <laughs> completely different. Um, this could be a flash in the pan, but he's been really great the last two weeks. Yeah, he's been amazing, and, and you know when that cider and Sherratt pairing broke up. It was, hey, like this probably needed to happen. And like Wallman then has played really well. And it's been like, okay, that's great. And then to even further just like reiterate and really drive the point home that that was the right thing to do, Ben Sherratt has been brutal. And I think the Toronto game was just the epitome of what he's looked like 
I, I mean, it, it it was it was a really rough game. The 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 Leafs game for Sherratt was was really rough. He did I not mean, look good at all. Taking bad penalties, bad pinches that thankfully Andrew Cop was able to recover on. Bad shot selection, and you know, I'm Prashant Iyer tweeted it out, and I'm glad he tweeted it out because I'm too much of a coward to say it. Um, but like Prashant's like, I I don't understand why teams value Sherrod as much as they do because it's not that this isn't and we we had this we asked that question when they signed him and at the time you're like trust the Iser plan like if Iserman values him and like clearly the GMs are seeing something we're not right and and on paper we had this conversation over the offseason too is like on paper him and Sider together isn't a, a when it just comes to the style of how they both play it's like not a terrible idea on paper, but like clearly not only has it not worked on the ice, I think it overstayed its welcome. This yeah. is something that should have changed by like, like honestly, probably like American Thanksgiving. Like this was not, <laughs> it was brutal, man. Like really, really brutal. And even since switching pairings, like cider has looked better. Wallman has looked better. And Shira continues to to struggle. And fun fact, um, during the Toronto Maple Leafs game, the Red Wings at the at the end, when you total it tally it all up, the Red Wings had the edge in Corsi, Fenwick, scoring chances, high danger Corsi, and expected goals for. The only thing they didn't have an edge in is shots for. And obviously, the biggest part of that is because the Red Wings caved in the Toronto Maple Leafs in the first period, shots wise. I mean, I think the Maple Leafs had one more shot with a second left to get the two shots at the end of the first period while the Red Wings had like 11. But, you know, obviously as the game went on, that changed and the Maple Leafs woke up. At the third period, the Maple Leafs had 70% of the shot attempts. It was, the Maple Leafs were just caving the Red Wings in. But it just kind of furthers that argument that this team is now capable of competing with teams at even strength, but just cannot find the back of the net. And, with Jake Wallman's goal, the only goal in the game being Jake Wallman, who again is being super electric. I think the only reason that happens is because Jake Wallman being a defenseman coming out of the box was able to get behind the Maple Leafs defenders because they see Wallman coming out of the box, realize he's a defender, and figure he's going to the bench for a change. And he made it look like that's what he was doing. And then, so they just they just forgot that assignment. Oh, the, the speaking of bench rock, because speaking of assignments, jogged my memory, one of those goals happened, the Tavares goal, because... And it was a bit of a miscommunication. It's not entirely Ben Sherratt's fault because they said it during the, the intermission that Lucas Raymond was covering Tavares into the offensive zone and then peeled off. So Ben Sherratt saw that and decided to cover the winger. But once Raymond peeled off, Sherratt then had to recover. But, I mean, two-on-one, Phil Peronic took his man thinking that Sherratt was going to cover Tavares coming down low with no one covering him. So Hronik played that right, taking the guy with the puck, trying to close the gap, force him along the boards, because he was expecting, and he rightfully so, should have expected somebody to cover the other guy because it was a two-on-two. But Tavares somehow got left all alone for a, a, an in in the front of the net, zero pressure somehow chance got on Magnus Helberg. All alone, and yeah. not just like kind of alone. I mean like no one within a zip code. Like, yeah. Like all alone. <laughs> so it's like again, that's partially a, that's just a miscommunication between Raymond and Sherratt. So I'm gonna be fair and not give Sherratt all of the blame on that goal against, but he does serve as part of the blame, and Raymond does too. Because Raymond, I don't know why you peeled off of that guy if you had him covered, but it, it's just it's a very frustrating period of Detroit Red Wings hockey right now because on paper, this Red Wings team and Magnus Helberg for the record played pretty well. I've been really happy with him in a backup role. He's been putting the team in a chance to win in these games. But these this Red Wings team over this stretch has been really frustrating to watch because on paper, this team is a more skilled team than the team last year, yet it feels like we're watching the same brand of hockey where they are struggling to score goals. They're giving up three or four a night, and they're just losing the hockey games. And it, it's... I'm going into the games no longer, and I realized this last night, and early in the season, it was the polar opposite. Earlier in the season, I thought going into the games, the Red Wings had a chance, and I was even expecting them to win. During this stretch, and I know it's a stretch, I recognize that, but during this stretch, I go into games going, 
thinking, well, I hope we can score more than one goal tonight. Like I'm not expecting the win anymore. And it's just, is it's a coaching problem. Let's just call it what it is. Yeah. It's also like, if you look at the schedule in January, it's not to say necessarily that the wings are playing, you know, like they're not playing the Leafs every night. They're not playing the the elite of the elite on a night tonight basis necessarily, but the schedule in January is rugged. It is brutal. Like they play so many games from now until, uh, uh, until the all-star break at the beginning of February. Like there, there is a, the, the, they, they play often. And so, like, if you don't figure something out and make an adjustment and make a change and, and like, try and go on a <laughs> heater here, it, it's it's going to spiral pretty quickly and it's going to blow up in your face pretty quickly. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you can point to a lot of things. And, obviously, if, if you're starting at the top, then, yeah, 100%. It just goes back to, to coaching. And we've talked about the personnel. And how, like, this isn't a top of the NHL type of personnel unit for sure either yet. Um, but clearly something's not working. So No, and, like, I'm willing to give Derek alone time. I'm not calling for his head by any stretch of the imagination. It's his first year as an NHL head coach. And there, there does deserve to be a little bit of a buffer. I don't think he's been awful by any stretch. I don't think the coaching staff's been bad. But I think that there is something to be said. Because, like you said, we said. <laughs> that this team lacks a superstar. But on this other side of the coin, this team, like I said, is on paper so much better than they are last year. And I know Bertuzzi's been out. I know Verona's been out. But even besides that, Kubalik, Peron, Sherratt, hypothetically, um, Wolman since coming back, has been great. Now you have Fabry back. Soderblom, Berggren, and Villano have been really good this season. Rasmussen's taken a huge step forward. Like, there are individuals on this team. Huso's been... Uh, miraculous. I know he's been not as good lately, but that's not necessarily 100% his fault as the team around him hasn't been very good. This team on paper is so much better than they have, were last year, yet it feels like we're getting the same results that you can't help, but, and I, I've, I've been hesitant to say this because he's a first-year head coach, and I don't want to be too hard on Derek Lalone quite yet, but there's been a failure to adjust. There absolutely has been a failure to adjust on the coaching staff's part because the things that were working well in the se- early in the season aren't working well anymore, and there hasn't been much of an adjustment. I know they're doing a little bit of a line blunder, trying to find new things that find chemistry. And I know people hate that, but let's be honest, guys, you're not finding the back of the net. You need to try new things. Like that's just, you have to do that. But if the other teams are starting to figure out what you guys are doing and that's working, and then they stifle that and you fail to change, then you're not doing your job as a coaching staff. And again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to overreact, but it's just something I've noticed. It's- yeah, it, it it just it feels like it feels like somebody lays out like f- like five cups of water. Okay, just like bear with me here. This is gonna make sense. This is gonna be a great analogy. Okay, someone puts out five cups of water, and each cup of water is labeled with like a different facet of the game. It's like five on five play, special teams, goaltending. I mean, at this point, like health, like everybody, like each each cup has like a different facet of the game. And someone gives you a giant water pitcher and is like, fill up all five of these cups of water. And they don't give you enough water to fill up all five cups completely. And you're just like constantly like trying to like, oh, well, this one's full tonight. Like, this is a great, it's been great at five on five lately. Like, an adjustment clearly was made, and like the five on five has been better, and like that's good. But why did it come at the expense of the, the special, special teams? Team. Why is there a correlation there? Like, why, why did the why did the good special teams at the beginning of the year? Why is that? Why are those mutually exclusive things? They shouldn't be. And it's not like it's not like these are things that are like we're sacrificing special teams for five on five play. That's not how it works. It's just right. like one no, falls out point. of Yeah, I know. It, it's just like one falls out of sync when the other one syncs up because they're different different coaches handle different facets of the right. game. And it's just it, like it, it, why it's, won't uh, you mesh? Right. <laughs> it's just like why can we not get five full cups of water? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean at the end of the day again boils down to step forward year, right? 
Like that's what we keep hammering home. We don't expect this team to make the playoffs. We want yeah. them to compete for the playoffs as long as possible. Finish with more points than they did last year. That's what we want for a successful season. But during stretches like this, not even stretches. I mean, since Thanksgiving, it's been a little bit more down than up recently. It starts to make it hard to see those step forwards being taken. It, it does. So, you know, it's rough right now. It's it's tough. Um, but we will persevere and we will judge the season as a whole when the season ends. But right now they're not playing great hockey and it's frustrating to watch. And so I'm going to come on the podcast and be frustrated with the team because what else am I supposed to do? I, I mean, I, I'm with you. I, don't know. <laughs> I did the same thing, man. I don't know why you're asking me. <laughs> I, I, I just, I want so bad to be objective about the situation. And like, I try my best to be. But, like, emotions are a part of this, right? We're emotionally invested in this team. And when they underperform as badly as they have in those recent games or when they actually perform well, you know, New Jersey, we, again, broken record, they've been outplaying the team at even strength. And then they just can't score goals. It's like, oh, my God. Like, I love – and that's the thing is it comes from love. Like, I love this team. I love what they're doing. I love the direction. I just want to start seeing results, man. I'm ready. Give me the results. But now I'm rambling. Yes. We can save the rest of this argument for a, another day. Oh, also, Nadelkovic, um, like a 950 save percentage with the Grand Rapids Griffins in his yeah. three starts. They lost in a two, shootout. 2-0-1. Oh, yeah, Verona's got an assist now um, in six games played. So just a little update on them. Uh, Yeah, that'll do it, Scotty. Any final thoughts, man? We're way over. We ball, baby. Knew this would happen, though, with two game recaps. It, there's no way we were going to keep that within 30. Yeah. We'll be back on Tuesday. Probably talk a little happy bit. Happy belated birthday to Brian. Oh, thank you, by the way. Everyone say that. happy belated. He's yeah. like 42 years old I'm now. 27. <laughs> <but> thank you. <laughs> uh, we'll be back on Tuesday. Let's maybe talk a little bit about Red Savage and the uh, Team USA World Juniors because he was. Yeah, the only, yeah, we can really just talk possible. juniors. Yeah. Let's talk, and then a game preview, of course. So we'll be back tomorrow, same time, same place. It's your team every day. Every day.